Professor Hotekwa, Senior Deputy President and Provost of NUS. Mr. Tan Kok Yam, Deputy Secretary in the Office of the Prime Minister of Singapore. Professor Daniel Hastings, CEO and Director of the Singapore MIT Alliance for Research and Technology. Mr. Lim Kok Kiang, Assistant Managing Director of the Economic Development Board. Mrs. Ko, students and fellows, ladies and gentlemen. One of the special strengths of Tembusu College, something we're most known for globally, is our teaching and research in the field called STS. That stands for Science, Technology, and Society, or as they style it in Europe, Science and Technology Studies. There are over 170 STS departments, centers, and institutes around the world, including at most of our peer and aspirate universities. But as far as I know, we are the only college with an STS-themed curriculum. Why is that important? Well, at least when I was an undergraduate, and I know that was a long time ago, um, you could still get a humanities degree and never once think about science or technology, except to fear it. And you could be a scientist or engineer and never once consider the social effects of your lab work. Now, I suppose you can still do that, but the college, this college, is out to convince you that you shouldn't. That society and technology are so entangled in the 21st century that no matter what you do in life, you'll be much more competent and effective, I dare say even happier, if you can bridge what the writer C.P. Snow famously called the two cultures of academe, the humanities and social sciences on the one side and technology and science on the other. And of course, in reality, there are more than just two. That's why a place like Tembusu is so important. Almost every one of your modules explores the ways in which society, culture, science, and technology are closely knitted together. And that's why tonight's forum is not just topical, but it's particularly relevant to our community. Two summers ago, while most of you were off on internships or exchanges, over 450 historians, anthropologists, sociologists, philosophers of technology from 40 countries gathered at your college for the largest STS conference ever held in Asia. And we had as our keynote speaker, Professor Bruno Latour, the world's preeminent STS theorist. I mention that because we have in the audience tonight as our special guests, 15 visiting colleagues from the Center for the Sociology of Innovation of the School of Mines in Paris, where Latour did most of his pioneering research and which remains a major STS think tank. They're actually making a re return visit, having come here last year specifically to understand Singapore's Smart Nation initiative. And tomorrow, they'll be sharing some of their findings with two undergraduate classes here at the college. In other words, the fourth industrial revolution in Singapore is not just a concern of Singapore, but is being followed around the world. Now, I know Professor Tommy Ko doesn't consider himself an STS scholar, but his interests have clearly influenced our research and teaching in this area. The most obvious example is our course on climate change, but he's also inspired our work in biodiversity and conservation, and even art and technology. These are topics we teach about, research about, and create activism around. And of course, we engage policymakers. And we have a particularly illustrious panel of people in the know tonight. To introduce them and the topic of our forum, let me now invite to the podium the convener of the Tembusu Forum, Professor Tommy Ko. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Um, as we are a few days away from the beginning of a new Lunar New Year, I want to begin by wishing all of you um, good fortune, success in your exams, success in your relationships in a year of doc. I want to also extend a very warm welcome to our friends from France. Um, Greg, I think I should explain that the School of the Minds is one of the grand écoles in France. You know, it's one of the elite 
elite uni universities in France. So this is, these are super bright people. I want to also welcome Professor Lawrence Weiss. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know whether Annabelle Kwok is here. I don't see her. Um, I invited a 25-year-old Singapore woman who is remarkable. At only 25 years of age, she's founded a company that provides consultancy services in artificial intelligence. So she'll be here with us soon. Um, the topic of our forum this evening is the fourth industrial revolution in Singapore. My, my wife asked me why the fourth industrial revolution and what were the first three. So this is my reply to my wife. The first revolution was the agrarian revolution. And this happened about 10,000 years ago when humans stopped foraging for food and learned to grow food. They also learned to, domestic, to domesticate animals. Food production was increased. Population was enhanced. And human settlement grew in size. This led, in turn, to the growth of villages, towns and cities. The second revolution was the Industrial Revolution. And this began in the 18th century and uh, accelerated in the 19th and 20th century. The Industrial Revolution was powered by the invention of the steam engine, electricity, and mass production. Um, there's a general consensus that the third Industrial Revolution began in the 1960s with the invention of the computer, semiconductors, personal computing, and the internet. This then brings me to the fourth industrial revolution. The fourth industrial revolution probably began at the turn of this century. What is driving it? It is being driven by technology and digitization. Technology and innovation have given rise to companies which disrupt the status quo. Companies such as Airbnb, which um, has more rooms than any hotel or hotel group. Uber, which is disrupting the taxi industry. Alibaba and Amazon, um, which champion e-commerce and is challenging the conventional retail business. Other example, the Internet of Things, smart cities, big data for decisions, driverless cars. Driverless cars will have a huge impact in America. I don't know whether you know that there are 3 million American men who drive for a living. They drive trucks, taxis, and other vehicles. Artificial intelligence, robotics, blockchain, sharing economy, 3D printing, nanotechnology, and financial technology. What is different about the fourth industrial revolution from the three previous in the, uh, revolution is that it is taking place at such a rapid speed and it is broad. It is affecting every sphere of human endeavor. The question I want to ask tonight is, how will the fourth industrial revolution affect Singapore? How can we harness the new opportunities and minimize the negative consequences for us? We have um, four outstanding speakers this evening, and I want to begin by requesting Professor Ho Teck Huang, the se Senior Vice President and Provost at the University, to lead us off. Teck Huang, please. Sound system good? Good enough? Okay, good. So I'd rather walk than uh, stay there so that they can't capture my images so easily. Uh, let me just uh, use the laser pointers. Uh, bring it on. So I actually uh, just want to start by saying that uh, whenever Tommy Cole sent me an email, I know there'll be a request and I have to say yes to him. So, so it's hard to say no to him. And you guys are very lucky to have him as a rector for the college. 
He almost can gain access to anybody you want to invite. He will be able to invite the person. But let me start by actually giving you a piece of information. So from the dawn of the civilization to 2003, there were about five exabytes of information being created, which is about five billion gigabytes. And every two days now, we have five exabytes of information being created. So that's how fast information have, right? If you ask yourself, where are those information come from? Think about it. Where, where are those come from? And I would say there are two domains that's very clear. First domain is medical domain, all the imaging that you do. And a lot of those images are very high density kind of resolution kind of images. Second is social media. And you guys contributed to that in a big way. Your YouTube, your pictures, your Facebook posts. And if you think of it that way, and whatever we do for digital revolutions, you need data. Without data, nothing's going to happen. In fact, when you do AI, machine learning, you need data, right? So a lot of things that we're going to actually see breakthrough will be in medical domain, in my view, and social media that you will be excited about, like people buying things. Uh, you can be actually tracking your individual the job profile over time, and so on and so forth. I will give you a couple of examples in, in this talk, right? First of all, I'm going to start with promises. I'll start with a very simple baby example, which everybody will know what to do. You guys should know. Amazon.com. Uh, any, any of you guys have not bought a book from Amazon? Raise your hand. Nobody. That's a good sign. You guys are really into Amazon. So, so actually, if you look at Amazon, uh, they use uh, big data. I'll come back about what kind of big data they collected. And they use machine learning to try to figure out what you like when you check out from the counter whenever you leave the, the, uh, the Amazon website. And surprise, 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 35% of the revenue come from that little software feature that they have. 35%. And they somehow able to guess what you like somehow. And actually, if you look at the list of listings that they have for the books, it's a long list. If I ask you to go and search for the books that you like to read, you won't be able to figure out with an hour or two, but they can do it like that because of technology and because of data that they have, right? I want to actually use this example to kind of point out three things that I want you guys to think about and then maybe we can talk about it at the end, right? First, there were no, there were abundant data, no privacy concern. Uh, do you guys care about your data being captured by Amazon on the internet? Not really. Maybe if you're buying something sensitive, you might care about, but if you generally buy books, video, you don't really care about it. Second thing is this is very simple. I want to actually make a point. When the recommendation system make an error, which sometimes they do, you don't buy any books, will you be upset? There's no, uh, I'll say no one get hurt, right? But this might not be true when you go into other AI application. For example, you have some AI engine to look at X-ray, they made a mistake. And you thought you were okay, but actually you're not okay. What do you do? Who is to be blamed? And the third thing I want to actually say is, is that in this case, both Amazon and the customer in this case benefit from the technology. Amazon make more money. You actually simplify your search process. You actually, you make, you have more efficiently searching for the product you want. Both sides benefit. But many cases, this might not be the case. Huh? I'll come back to that a little bit. So let me just start with two examples. I like to give examples. And this is my dream application. This is not what AI Singapore will do. I just want to clarify that. This is my own view. I actually want to develop for all NUS students, alumni, a simple app. They will have all the courses you take at NUS. Every week, in the Monday, they will give you a po job posting of what you're potentially interested in. And they will tell you for that job, you need to take two more classes to qualify for that job. Their apps will be with you for your lifetime from 20 to 70 years. So that's what I want to do. Would that be cool? Of course. They, their, their website is really doing that. I want to do it for NUS and alumni, right? So that's one thing I want to do. Second thing is for like healthcare. I can think of many, many things that you could potentially make everybody happy, live longer, and so on and so forth. We'll come back to that. Uh, I want to give you this actually uh, Superman video. Right? So allow me to, to uh, entertain you with a video. This is a Genesis chamber. All Kryptonians were conceived in chambers such as this. Every child was designed to fulfill a predetermined role in our society as a worker, a warrior, a leader, and so on. Okay, so I don't think this will ever happen. <laughs> but it's kind of scary. But in a way, they say we have a slightly less version of that 
that we actually does know what you like, what your passion is, what you're capable of doing. And I can customize for you a job for you over time. From when you are young, I track you. I know what you're good at. You like to play with certain things. I kind of nudge you and get you to learn the right thing. And the goal of the thing is to actually maximize your lifetime happiness and also lifetime income. Uh, is it possible to be done? I think it's possible. But would that be, will you be comfortable letting people know all your history of the class that you have taken, what you like and dislike? May not be. You see the point now? What happened? The machine screw up. They give you the wrong job recommendation. It destroy your life for many, many years, right? So that's another thing that we'll talk about. And, this and the, is a general. They're gonna over. Uh, I, there are two companies that have been doing that. Uh, you can see from here that uh, the first one just give you job recommendation. Very simple. They look at what you look at, what you don't look at. Uh, they will, over time, they learn to adapt to your style, what you're looking at, so they will give you better job alerts and so on and so forth. Second one is a little more interesting. They want to match you with a job you're more likely to succeed. That's cool, I think. Uh, my, my number one concern for my students is always, are you getting the job that you want, that you pursue your life passion? It's not about the pay, it's about your life passion, right? And this one, they actually get you to play games. They're trying to figure out what, kind, what you're good at and then accordingly customize a job for you. Uh, both are really in the market. Uh, uh, they are kind of cool, but I don't know how good they are. As I say, you remember that little fear about they might give you the wrong recommendation. And the second is healthcare markets. Uh, as you can see from here, uh, there's a lot of big data and genomics, uh, whatever thing that you've done in the past, they capture that. They give you a personalized, customized medicine. And a lot of those actually, they can detect the disease before it appears. For example, can I forecast when I'm going to have a heart attack? Can I forecast when I get cancer? And so on and so forth. And we just hired somebody from UCLA. His life passion is all about giving optimal dosage based. Let's say you're a cancer patient. They customize the dosage across the treatment period. Many times, the dosage recommendation is from the U.S. market. While Asian, we're a little smaller, our dosage might have to be lower, and so on and so forth. Uh, so imagine you have a system like that. I'm pretty sure we'll live longer, for sure. Uh, and, but there are times that the machine might make mistakes too. Again, huh? So I, come back, I just want to remind you a little bit on that. And, but the promise is big. And a lot of companies are trying to invest in this. This is like saving human life. It's so noble and so powerful, right? And uh, IBM is investing heavily money at IBM Watson. A lot of complaints about them recently. Their goal is to get the oncologists to be even better in recommending you treatments and so on and so forth. Second one is actually CDHI, UCSF, working with Intel. Both of these companies, I call it figure out AI system for the doctor to provide better treatment for you. But there's a big kind of white space there that how about figuring out AI technology for individual patients? We will have a lot of wearable technology. How about those wearables can be used to get you to exercise more? I'm actually doing a project now to get people to exercise more. I pay you money to exercise like cab driver, pay you money to walk and so on and so forth, right? And a lot of possibility. If you were to ask me, uh, would this be very big in 10 years time? Yes, for sure. Uh, in fact, we are trying to go through a, a lot of brainstorming within Singapore government and NUS and IHL that can we actually tackle a big grand challenge in AI that we all feel excited about it, that we're going to make a difference in the society. And challenges, I won't give you challenges. I have only five more minutes. i give you three challenges. First is about privacy of data. I believe in this. Everybody has the right to be forgotten. They have the right to be remembered. That's the ideal world. So I always have this crazy idea. Can I actually invent a digital eraser, go to the internet, erase all the things I say that are stupid? Is it possible? It would be nice to have that. So everybody can choose what to erase, what not to erase, right? But nobody has figured out that technology. You figure that, I can tell you, it would sell a lot, a lot of money. And this is actually a big problem. Uh, we, we all, I mean, I know that some of us are uncomfortable about being tracked. Uh, for example, let's say I know where you are when, at any single point in time. That it is, would that frighten you a little bit? Uh, and I don't think we have figured out what, how to solve this, but I do want to make a, actually a pitch to you guys to think about this this way. I think everybody should have a choice how much they want to reveal themselves. 
for example, I'm perfectly okay if people use my data for discovering a cure for cancer. But I'm not so okay if you use my data to sell it to an insurance company so that they can charge me premium for that. I don't like that because even though I'm perfectly healthy, but I don't think it's fair for the society to kind of penalize the group of people who are not healthy. You see my point? But it's really, really an interesting issue. And, and so far, what I hear so far is all about the common policy for everybody. I'd rather you choose a policy that you feel comfortable about and we're given policy option to review ourselves, how much you want to review ourselves, right? When you're reviewing yourself, okay, when you erase your name. Uh, in Singapore, this is a big problem because our birth cohort is very, very small. I'll give you an example. I have recently got data about cancer registry, but our birth cohort is only 40,000. You divide by 365, about 100 baby per day. You divide by district code, that was 29 of them, it's two, three baby in the district code. If I know your address, a birthday, that's it, I know where you are. This is kind of, we're small, that's why we're small, we're not big. And we had to figure out a way to deal with this in a serious way for digital revolution to happen. The fourth industry will only happen when the data is easily accessible and can be easily exploited to do something powerful. Second thing is about, when AI made a mistake, who is liable? I actually want to debate about it because let's say somebody drive a driverless car, go into an accident, no, no, no drivers. Huh? I always like a virtual driver. You're sitting behind, you're enjoying your cup of tea, and accident happened. Who are you to be blamed? Yourself? You made the choice of make, buying the car? Is the company who produced the car or the AI company who produced the AI software and so on and so forth, right? We really need to talk about it. I actually, want to, this is quite serious. I'll give you an example. Recently, a relative visited myself a couple of years back. I was living at Berkeley. They visited me. They were looking for... Marriott Hotel, but they didn't know that Mar there are many Marriott Hotels in San Francisco and, and Berkeley. So they typed Marriott Hotel. The first one came out was actually in San Francisco. We're having dinner in Berkeley. She drove all the way back to San Francisco. I was waiting. How happened to her? How come she didn't show up? She followed the GPS, and GPS brought her to San Francisco. I know it sounds funny. It just happened to you. It happened to me too. Sometimes I just follow the GPS. They, they bring me to the road that I don't like to go to. Maybe dangerous routes and so on, right? Let's say you got robbed because of the GPS. Are you liable or GPS is liable? The last one I want to talk about is actually this one. Division of labor between machine and, and human being. This is actually a, a book that I want you guys all to read. Uh, the E.M. Foster, The Machine Stop. In that book, it was written in 1909, uh, many, many years ago, 100 years ago. It was about an AI world where human beings are living underground. There's a big, gigantic machine that do the coordination. You have this machine going out and collecting information. Every night, you go back, you download back to yourself. And there was a family, a father and a son trying to... And it's one day, the machine stopped. What do you do? It's kind of a scary thought, right? Anyway, so... so and and uh, we had to plan for the case that the machine stopped. Do we have the capability to do the things that machines are doing when sometimes machines stop? And this can happen. Uh, and this will happen, and so on and so forth. Okay, let me give you what NUS has been doing for, allow me to sell NUS a little bit for one, one minute. Huh? So I have been actually, uh, since I joined US in 2015, I'm obsessed with this innovation 4.0 building. It's about innovating for the industry 4.0. In that building, I, I, I just finished get a TOP this, uh, this year, uh, this week. Uh, inside, there are three things that you will like. First, 24-7 coffee at low prices, high-quality high coffee. Second, it has the fastest Wi-Fi in Singapore. The third is Google Live Space. There are 30% collaborations for you to hang out, drink coffee, talk, and so on and so forth. We have that. We already have many things inside there. AI Singapore is within the fifth floor, the whole entire floor, 2,000 square meters. We have work with Singtel on the corporate level on cybersecurity. We even have behavioral people who are humanity and social. Look at the risk associated with technology, for example. I'm actually the center for uh, behavioral economy, the director of that. I figure out a way to nudge people to, the right, to do the right thing. And it's an exciting thing. We're, we're going to call it Innovation 4.0. We just launched it. You guys hopefully will get a chance to enjoy the building and experience the Industry 4.0, all the gadgets that we have. I have to say the coffee is... We have a robotic app recognize your face. They give you the coffee you ordered before uh, last time. It's pretty cool. Thank you. Uh, 
Um, <laughs> thank, thank you very much, Tegwang. Can you invite all of us to visit? Yes, the <laughs> um, there was a report recently by, <coughs> by McKinsey on <coughs> jobs. And uh, according to this report, Mac McKinsey, 25% of the jobs in our manufacturing sector may be in jeopardy because of robotics and, and other disruptive technology. So I've invited a friend from EDB, Lim Kok Kiang, the Assistant Managing Director of EDB, to talk to us about the fourth industrial revolution and its impact on our manufacturing sector. Uh, Kok Kiang, please. So this is um, learning from my previous speaker. So I'm also trying to... Actually, the only reason also partly is because then I can look at my slides a little bit better. <laughs> um, it's, well, so maybe as we are preparing the slides, I, I think um, as Professor Ko has mentioned, I think there are a couple of things that characterize the I in fourth industrial revolution, right? It's technology, it's digitalization, it's speed. And all that, when come together, has immense impact on the way we live, the way we work, and the way goods are produced, the way services are rendered. So I think uh, uh, for my uh, part of the uh, presentation, I'll focus a little bit more on the industrial side, on manufacturing, and uh, what are we doing to take advantage of this situation. So hopefully some of the things that I mentioned about would actually be relevant to the other industries as well and the other parts of uh, society. So uh, do bear that in mind, but I thought it's useful for me to give a concrete example of something that I'm a little bit more you know, um, familiar with to help us along the, with the journey. So um, firstly, manufacturing. Um, now I sell the Goyok first, huh? unlike uh, Prof Ho who, you know, leave it to nearest the end. Uh, I just wanted to point out that actually, you know, manufacturing still continues to be a, an important pillar in our economy. 20% of GDP, 14% of employment. Now what we produce in Singapore today. So think aero engines that go into your Dreamliner, Boeing 747, that you ride, you know, when you go overseas. The blades that goes into the engine that goes into the Dreamliner, all those are things we manufacture. The motors that goes into your Dyson vacuum cleaner that you buy. The motors that goes into your you know, revolutionary Dyson hair dryer that you buy. That is also manufactured in Singapore. For some of you who like cycling, some of the parts that Shimano makes that goes into your high-end bikes and races are manufactured in Singapore. So I just wanted to name a few examples of you know, products that are actually being done in Singapore today, made in Singapore today. But sometimes we don't see it because uh, our industry has evolved to a point where we're actually making more of the more IP-intensive, knowledge-intensive, skills-intensive, and they tend to be components rather than systems. And so sometimes we don't get to hear a lot of them. But we do have a strong base. Just one other point that I thought I want to mention is really, I mean, manufacturing in Singapore, as you all know, we compete on a global basis. We, 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 the manufacturers here can't just live on the 5 million population in Singapore, if not all of them won't be here anymore, right? Because they compete on a global basis, they are globally competitive. This is a chart that just points out that from a productivity standpoint, uh, manufacturing has always been leading uh, productivity growth or above average productivity growth across all the sectors. And because we are competing and we need to compete. Uh, the other you know, in the other data point that I want to mention, you know, is really the fact that actually if you think about manufacturing, um, a study is a survey on R&D and actually manufacturing, engineering, electronics and chemicals collectively accounts for over 70% of business expenditure in R&D. So it is also very tied to innovation, to technology and good jobs there as well. So I thought I just wanted to raise that. Now, fourth industry revolution, I4.0 as we call it, I think it is really changing the way manufacturing is done as well, just very much as it's changing the way you travel, changing the way you book your hotels. Essentially, you'll find that in manufacturing, labour cost becomes a slightly less important, it's still important, but a slightly less important component, technology goes up. And what that means is actually levels the playing field for manufacturing globally. That's why you hear the likes of US, UK also saying that I want manufacturing jobs, I want to have manufacturing activities. And I think all these play to Singapore's strength. Why? Because we have a skilled workforce, we have a base of companies here. And on the other hand, we have resource constraint, which actually I4.0 can actually help us address. So I just wanted to use that to set the context. I will then talk a little bit about, I think uh, Professor Ko has actually mentioned this as well, about just what is exactly I4.0. And to me, it is really about automation or manufacturing technology in the case of manufacturing, eh? like 3D printing, 
along with digitalization, such as AR, VR, data analytics, machine learning, how the two, when integrated, unleashes value for company and for consumers at the same time. And it's technology that enables that. And that's what makes it so cool. And that's what makes it so disruptive. So um, a little bit about what we've been doing. Uh, but this one, simplistically put, we're trying to bring more center of excellence from the supply side, people apply technology to Singapore and grow our local players there as well. I think Prof. Kohl talked about the artificial intelligence startup in Singapore. We are trying to, not just EDB, of course, working with the rest of the government ecosystem, try and grow the supply side. We adopt, we push for adoption in our companies, big and small, to leverage technology in their own little way to start. And of course, we try and build an ecosystem with NUS, with ASTAR, to support companies able to do so. So I wouldn't spend too much time on that in the interest of time as well. But at the same time, we also recognize that actually a lot of people are still trying to figure out what exactly I4 points, how does it impact me as a manufacturer? What do I do and how I go about doing it? So another effort that we embark on is really to create what we call an index. There are 16 elements, basically to help provide a common language for all of the companies and executives and people in the industry to think a little bit better about what actually I4.0 is. Then it has a grading scale which allows you to you know, do assessment of where you are today and where you need to go to going forward. So I think it's just a tool that we thought was important to create, but I'm actually going to use it to also share a little bit about what I think all I4.0 is about. Now, as you can imagine, and I mentioned that earlier as well, when we think I4.0, we always think about the technology. But it is not only technology. Technology is just but one of what we think is three important pillars in the whole journey of fourth industrial revolution. The other one is actually process. Uh, to put it very simplistically, if you have a crap process and you digitalize it, you get a digitalized crap process. Nothing changes. So you have to continuously enhance your process as well in what you do, whether in retail, in manufacturing. On top of then, thinking about how technology will enable you to make your process even better. So the two are actually symbiotic. But is the two alone enough? And the answer is also no. Because you do need people. And I've always said that in technology, it's not about technology or people, but technology and people working hand in hand. Experience is something that can never be underestimated in the whole process. So I think even in a company who's trying to adopt technology, change their processes to get the people in the company excited and go along with the journey to innovate with the company is something that is very important. And I think to a certain extent, it's a little bit to our, it plays to our strength as well because we do have a very good workforce and all of you, some of you will e eventually you know, be in that workforce as well. And I think it is important, and, I, and, and Professor Cole also mentioned the fact that 25% of the workforce will be disrupted. But if you think about Singapore, right, where we uh, really have a highly skilled workforce and our workforce is not growing that much, in order for us to continue to punch above our weight, doing with less resources to get more outcomes is something that actually works to our favour compared to many other economies be it the US or somewhere else. So I think from that perspective, we have to turn this into an opportunity for us to grow industry, adopt technologies, and I, by that I don't mean just manufacturing, even though I just use manufacturing as an example. Now, having said that, I'm going to go on to talk a little bit about the people uh, aspect of it. Now, even if 75% of the job still remains intact, chances are 70% of the 75% of the jobs will remain the same. You have to change your way of do, doing things for the remaining 30 in order for you to continue to be relevant. Because as you adopt technology, you need to pivot and learn new skills and new capabilities as well. And I think that is something that um, I think we are working to try and also see how we better do that. And that's where I go and talk a little bit about uh, uh, people perspective. Again, just to share a little bit of perspective, this is a study done by Accenture that talks about even if you are working in a process plants today, what are the new skill sets that you need to have as a technician, as an engineer, as a manager? And even inevitably, if you look at that with technology, with automation, with digitalization, you realize that there'll be new skill sets required that are tied to you know, data analytics, network engineering, not just in Uber and Google and Airbnb, but in the manufacturing shop floor, in the industrial space, it's becoming a key differentiator and, and, and it's really necessary as well, and of course robotics management. But above and beyond that, you'll find that soft skills are important as well. So things like design thinking, you know, agile development, all these are actually important skill sets if you want to integrate hardware and software, you want to integrate people with processes, with technology. 
So these are some of the new skill sets that even in the manufacturing shop floor we need to have. And we need to work and ensure that our population at large are able to embrace and get ready for this. I mean, honestly, for the younger generation, we're all very used to working on iPads, you know, making orders and so on. But for some of our slightly older, mature workforce, it, it still may be a challenge to try and get everybody up to speed. And one of the things that we have worked um, on is really on continuous education and training. And that's an area where uh, I talk about the skill sets. We've mapped that and worked with the likes of uh, Workforce Singapore, SkillsFuture Singapore, and the unions as well to roll out courses, what we call uh, digital confidence short modules. We call it digital confidence courses. The idea is to make sure that at whatever level you are in, there are short courses that you can take to build your digital confidence so they're able to deal with the changes that's happening in the operations, in the shop floor, wherever it may be, uh, in your line of work. And um, we have launched it in November last year. And some of our companies are taking it. In fact, one of the companies, uh, Makino, which actually does um, okay, pre precision machinery, they have said that they're going to send their entire workforce for the courses. And we will continue to pivot because technology is moving so fast, right? We have to continue to get feedback from companies, from the people who attended the courses, and see how we can then adapt and adopt those and further refine the courses as we go along as technology evolves. The good news for us is that this whole I 4.0 drive or fourth industrial revolution is not a switch that today is off, tomorrow is on. It's a continuous journey of evolution and change. So that gives us the ability to actually make sure that we work with, in this case, companies, but the workforce as well to adapt ourselves to the change as it goes along. Right? And I think, it's, I think the same can probably be said and applied to uh, across industry as well. And um, for the mid-career hires, we're also putting in place uh, people who are in the mid-career and looking for you know, job uh, transition. We've actually helped uh, place some of these people through professional conversion programs, again, with uh, uh, respective agencies to make sure that we place them in the jobs that are available today. And I think it's actually, uh, it may look like a small number, but we did place 1,000 odd in the manufacturing sector over the last year. So up to now, I have talked, I have three minutes left. Up to now, I've talked a lot about what we're doing in I4.0, how we're trying to help at least the manufacturing and se se uh, 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 sector in Singapore adapt and adopt. And lastly, I would just like to end with this, three minutes to talk a little bit about this. Uh, what does it mean for young talent? It is blank. Why is it blank? Because it's for you to create for yourself what it is. But if I can provide four perspectives just to share my thoughts on this are one and, and again from the slides that I presented. So one is really the fact that skill sets, right? Hard skills, soft skills are increasingly important. Do dabble in these skills. You need you need not be deep in all these areas, but it's good to know because all these are going to come in place and affect the way you work, the way you live as well. So again, not just hard skills, soft skills, but also try and learn broadly. I mean if you learn coding it's not because you're going to become a programmer, right? But it's good to know because that's how some of these things, when you, whatever career you embark on in future, it will come in handy to have a better perspective of how all these technologies are so that you can know how they interact and how they, you know, collectively can do more for you. So that's point number one. Point number two, also because technology is evolving so quickly, it is really about, in my words, learning, unlearning and relearning throughout your career whatever career you pursue, because whatever you've learned in school, I mean, no offense, I think it's a great curriculum, but it will be obsolete 30 years from now, because technology is moving so fast, right? In fact, maybe 20 years from now. So it's really about you also taking, you know, the effort to understand what are the technologies out there, what you need to learn to do your work better, to chase your dreams better, to, you know, take your startup to a different level better. So this whole journey of continuous learning and improvement and trying new things is something that you need to have in your Muscle, if you like. Third thing, precisely because technology is evolving so quickly, a lot of innovation actually happens on-site in operations itself. As you adopt technology, you are actually pivoting and trying to do new things. I was just speaking to an ex-colleague of mine that's in the data analytics field now. She's saying that when she goes into a project with a company, that's where she learns and that's where she pivots and creates the algorithms that she has not done before. Because you understand the domain, you have the expertise, and then you pivot and learn. And with that, you learn more and you do more. So that's the other thing. So if you want to pick up technology, 
One option is really to be in the forefront of where it is action. And that's where you learn the most, precisely because technology is evolving so quickly. Last point, of course, if you want to you know, pursue your dreams, start a new business, by all means carry on, Singapore needs more of you. So please you know, go ahead and do so. For those that think that you want to start working in the enterprise first, because that's where you build up some experience, then you can think about what you want to do next. I think it's a good idea as well. The only advice I give is then, back to the index as well, uh, leadership is actually very important. Choose a company where the leaders are really all for change, are all supportive of innovation and pushing boundaries because then that is the company where you will learn most because you are always innovating as opposed to a company where the leadership perhaps is a little bit more conservative. So that could be a kind of a yardstick you use when you think about you know, working in enterprises going forward as well. Okay, so with that, I kind of like uh, end my presentation, you know, look forward to the discussion with you guys later. Um, I, I thank Kok Kiang for a very interesting presentation. Uh, one of Singapore's aspirations is to be a smart city and a smart nation. And one of the leaders helping us to drive this and to, to achieve this ambition is our next speaker. Um, Tan Kok Yam is the Deputy Secretary of the Smart Nation and Digital, Digital Government Office in the Prime Minister's Office. I've invited Kok Yam to join us this evening and share with us how are we doing on this journey to being a smart city and a smart nation. Thank you, thank you, Prof. Go. I have no slides for you, but I have a, a little quiz. Um, one of the most common types of fires in Singapore are called shoot fires because we all live in high-rise buildings, HGB, HGB flats, and sometimes some people would throw flammable stuff down the chute and fires happen. Now, in 2015, um, the, the firefighters, the Singapore Civil Defence Force, sent a whole bunch of fire data to the data scientists in, in IDA, and they crunch and crunch and discover something interesting that um, the occurrence of uh, shoot fires peak either during January or in February of the year. Now, what phenomenon, my question is, what phenomenon happens either during January or February of the year? Very good. NUS students, very good. Yeah. <laughs> if, it will happen on, if it happens only in February, the data shows that then it's Valentine's Day. La. It's, the, it's the candlelight dinners. No. But, but as it is, uh, Lunar New Year is, is the reason for shoot fires happening in Singapore. I, I, I mentioned this uh, not because it is anywhere near the, the aspirations of uh, AI finding a cure for cancer or anything like that, but just as a small facet of what an industrial, what the fourth industrial re revolution might mean for at a government level, at a city level, and possibly at a nation level. And this leads to my first point about what a smart nation uh, wants to achieve. The first point is we want to transform government uh, to serve people better, both in terms of planning and policy making for the long term and in terms of providing services, uh, responding to things like fires and so on and so forth. Now, this transformation is not just about turning a service, a paper service, uh, a crap service, uh, so to speak, uh, into a, a, a website, a digital service. This transformation has to go to the core. Um, let me just give you an example. Uh, we we, we know that we have services that provide uh, different types of uh, uh, things to, to people at different points of their life. But all these services are organized by agency. The HDB will, will provide a digital service to you. The, the ABA, if you want to own a pet, a cat or dog, will provide some services to you and so on. But we are thinking of rearranging that, those services so that they are no longer you know, uh, packed to agency lines but rather pack to what you want in that moment of your life. So if you, at some point, hopefully, if you get married and you have a kid, what services do I pack together to allow that particular uh, uh, event to be happier than it already is, for, for example? So registration of birth, uh, opening of accounts, uh, and as a child grows slightly older, applying to a preschool, we are packing it all, putting the user, the citizen, in the center of services. Rather than starting from the point of view of putting the agency uh, at the center, 
of the, of the service provision. So this is not a change, this is not a cosmetic change. This is not putting a new wine into old wine skin, so to speak. This is about changing fundamentally the way we work across agencies, fundamentally how we relate to the citizen. So that's the first point of what we want to achieve uh, with uh, uh, Smart Nation. We want to transform government to serve people better. And in different places, uh, just, just to sort of benchmark with different, uh, different countries, in different places you see elements of that uh, in a smart city plan, for example. They want to improve the city. And because other countries are big, they have a smart city plan at a federal level, they have an e-government plan uh, to, to look at federal services. Well, in Singapore, because we are small, we mush it, kind of mush it together. So our e-government plan and our smart city plan is, is one plan. So that's the first point. Now, the second point, and it goes a bit to what uh, my colleague Kok Yang has already mentioned, is we really want to use the digital space to create the runway for our economy to grow. Now, I think there are two aspects to this. The first is being able to create stuff, uh, being able to create new services, uh, to create new intellectual property, uh, so to speak, that uh, serves not just Singaporeans, Singapore companies, but it's exportable. Uh, what, what, what drives that in the digital age? Talent drives that. Bright people, energetic people uh, drives that because bright people and energetic people will attract the challenging jobs, will attract the challenging uh, uh, options uh, to cite themselves here in Singapore. Uh, why do companies go to Silicon Valley to look for talent? Also because the air is nice, but, but primarily to look for talent. Now, what attracts talent, what, what attracts bright people uh, to a place is challenging jobs and challenging opportunities. So there's a certain virtual cycle here. The great challenges attract bright people, attract uh, energetic people to want to apply themselves to solve these problems, and the problems go to where the bright people are. So in terms of being able to create that ecosystem, we want to use the digital revolution, so to speak, to, to, to carve a niche for ourselves as a country, as an economy to do that. So that's one aspect of it. But there's a second aspect. The second aspect is about our productivity, because it is a mathematical truth, right, that we are going to have less and less people in the workforce. Um, those who age uh, will have to be, some of them at some point will have to be looked after by some people. So for people in the workforce, it's going to be, a, it's going to be an ever, uh, ever increasing pressure to, to, to be more productive, to do more with less. So in terms of looking at our small and medium science enterprises, the mom and pop shops, the, 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 the F&B store, how do they use technology, uh, digital technology? It doesn't have to be very advanced, doesn't have to have an AI or something, but how do I just use technology to improve the, the factory floor, the workings of the, 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 the restaurant or the coffee shop? How do I use all that to help them deal with, uh, with, uh, with doing more, with, with in maintaining their, their, their revenue streams with less and less uh, uh, labor available? And that's an important national problem for us to handle, and digital technology goes quite a way to help us deal with that. So that's the second, that's the second uh, objective of Smart Nation, to create that digital space uh, for us to be able to grow economically uh, through the digital domain. Now the third objective is a little bit, uh, if you like, it's a little bit woolier, but I think it's equally important, and it's about how do I use the digital domain to collaborate across the people sector across the government sector. I'll give you an example. We have an open data platform. So uh, uh, at uh, uh, data.gov.sg, we have all kinds of open data, including uh, transport data, for example. Uh, I think a year or two years back, uh, an enterprising uh, young Singaporean created an app called uh, Bus Uncle, which was, in and, and I don't know whether you guys use it, but it was an exceedingly rude app, right? And no civil servant, no bureaucrat like me will be able to create their app. But somebody did it using data that the government collects, and we are all the richer for it. I'll give you another example. Uh, when you graduate, which I think you all will at some point, you all want to get a, hopefully, a, a, maybe a credit card, maybe, maybe you have a, uh, maybe you need a loan or something like that, you go to the bank. Today, Today, the bank uh, will ask you to hand up some documents to prove that you have workplace and all that. But we have a pilot now with a bank where we open up 
a, uh, the My Info portal from the government side so that when you consent to that information being passed to the bank with your SIM pass, the data goes immediately to the bank. So this saves uh, manpower for the bank. It also gives you a more seamless experience when you go for that first home loan or that first uh, credit card. So that's just a small example of how we can collaborate together uh, using some, a platform that the government has built, uh, but really relying on the private sector, the people sector to innovate and make use of the data, the connectivity and the platform. And this way of working together of, uh, that the digital domain provides is a, is, is a new space and it's something that we want to push that we, we think is, is the way forward and something that is really very much a critical part of the whole smart nation uh, construct. Now, I've mentioned uh, what are some of the three, the, the three things that we want to achieve under smart nation. I'll talk a little bit about the challenges. Now, the first challenge is, you know, if some of you are engineers here, it's, it's a challenge with uh, clock speed, right? The digital clock speed goes at this speed, right? The physical clock speed goes much slower. So, lifts are not replaced as fast as you can upload new software to manage lifts. So, you have to deal with that difference in clock speed. Uh, we want to be masters of technology, but often we are enslaved to legacy systems. So we need to break that, uh, think of systematic ways to, to break that, that, that cycle. Otherwise, we'll always be enslaved to legacy systems. But there's also societal and policy clock speed. Technology moves this fast, but rulemaking, the cycles of rulemaking goes at a certain pace. Uh, is, uh, are the rules related to medical, uh, medical uh, the, the, the medical world, are they updated and relevant to what medtech devices can do. Uh, how about uh, autonomous vehicles? Uh, I give somebody a driving license because I know he can drive. Uh, what, what, who do I give a driving license to now uh, if, if it is autonomous? What rules must change? And these are the things that we need to struggle with constantly to be able to create the environment where we use digital technology, smart technology muscularly to serve people better. So the Ministry of Transport, uh, we are learning this together. It's figuring out how to test autonomous vehicles, uh, whether in an in a enclosed space, sort of like when you do, you know, when you go to Bukit Batok Driving Center, does it still exist? Yeah, it does. Yeah. Uh, to, to, to do, and then after that, at, on certain routes, maybe we need them to wear the provisional driver kind of triangle badge as well. But you get the point. There's a certain process that we need to do uh, to allow technology to be used in, in, in a safe way. So that's one challenge. Um, the second challenge is really about having people with the skills and the mindset uh, to really embrace the technology and run with it. Now, one of, the, one of the types of talents that we need are obviously computational, people who know the stuff, people who know what are AI algorithms, people who know how to do programming, people who can do data science, people who have all these um, technical capabilities uh, and can apply and can cook and can create uh, new product, new ideas based on them. But the second group of people uh, that uh, we need in this system are your the lawyer, your doctor who knows technology, who knows what legal tech means, who knows what med tech means, your, your um, business owner of the factory who is able to think about uh, sensors, uh, the internet of things and what it means to the business processes of his factory. Uh, your firefighter who knows how to use data science to figure out that during Chinese New Year, you better send people warnings about not throwing stuff down the rubbish chute. Uh, so these are, these are some of the, th this is key to being able to translate, being able to deploy technology in a way that is beneficial to society, that is beneficial to the economy, and that is beneficial to the nation as a whole. And this is a challenge, uh, it's not an easy challenge. We, we hope that some of you will help us rise to the challenge. Uh, a few of you all may be interested to solve that challenge, particularly for government. Uh, you, are, you want to sign on, you let me know. Uh, <laughs> as, as you can say, uh, Kokyang said enterprising, look for enterprising. Uh, uh, we, we hope enterprising organizations include the government. But anyway, enough Goyo. Yeah. Uh, so that's it. That, that's all I want to share. These are the three things you want to achieve. And these, I think, are the two major challenges. The clock speed of society, of, of the physicality of certain things. Uh, versus the clock speed of uh, digital technology and, and the, our ability to have the capabilities, uh, the talent and the, and the wherewithal to use uh, technology that is ever-changing and apply it to business processes 
apply it to how you do things, apply it in my case to policy making, but in your case it could be to, to your law firm, uh, in the finance world, in fintech, uh, and so on and so forth. So that's all I have to say, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I think Teck Hua has set a certain fashion, which is not to use the podium, but to speak from the floor. <laughs> um, I don't know whether Daniel is going to follow this or not. But, <laughs> but um, I, I want to briefly introduce our final speaker. Uh, MIT is deserved, deservedly one of the great universities of the world. And our next speaker is one of the senior professors at MIT. Professor Daniel Hastings is an expert of aeronautics and uh, of astronautics. Yeah. He's worked with NASA. Um, he's in Singapore as the CEO and director of the Singapore MIT Alliance for Research and Technology. His mission is to undertake world-class research on specific problems of societal interest of Singapore and of interest also to MIT. So, Professor Hastings. <laughs> so, I'm going to use a podium because I have some notes that I need to refer to every now and then as I will forget some points. So, I, I thought the first thing I'd do is start by consulting that fount of wisdom, Wikipedia on what is the fourth industrial revolution. So you can just look it up, right? It says, Industry 4.0 is a name for the current trend of automation and data exchange in manufacturing technologies. It includes cyber-physical systems, the Internet of Things, cloud computing, and cognitive computing. It creates what has been called a smart factory. Uh, and so on, it goes on and on about that. So it, it's very similar to the sort of things you've already heard. So I, I'm now going to give you my own perspective on, on that. And I, I see the uh, in fourth industrial revolution as being powered by a number of things, of which, of course, you've heard a number already. But here's my own take on two things which I think are very relevant. And it's basically the use of data in a large-scale way to enable better decision-making, but enabled by smart, low-power sensors and circuits which can be rapidly spread throughout the world. And you combine that with deep learning on the data you collect and you get a whole new way of doing business. So it, it's a combination of those things. It's the data mining, it's, a, it's the sensors which are a low cost that you can spread all around. So I, I'm going to give you three examples from work that's actually going on right over there in the center which I direct, which is in that big tall building, the Create Tower, as well as the buildings across the way. That, that actually illustrate this, I think, and uh, are relevant to Singapore. Uh, so we have a program in, in disruptive agriculture. And what these uh, professors are doing is actually putting nano sensors into plants. So they're not apart from the plant. They are in the plant cells. Right? So the plant can then tell you when it is stressed. So when it needs water, when it needs fertilizer, the plant then sends basically an infrared signal the infrared signal can be read remotely. Somebody, a farmer can pick it up over the internet and then can see what's going on in an entire field. Uh, so it, it, the idea is these watcher plants then, if you want, will now enable there to be much higher agricultural yields because at every point you'll know what's actually going on. So it's a combination of the sensors and the data and the backend processing that, that actually uh, will enable that. Uh, another thing that we're working on is combining analog and digital circuits into, into single chips. And the significance of this is that it enables much lower power chips, uh, which can then be spread around. So, for example, we're actually right now putting uh, chips on all the cargo containers in Singapore, is the idea. Uh, and the idea is, uh, powered by solar power, that once, once if, if we do this to completion, you'll know where all the cargo containers are in Singapore, right? And that just knowing that information allows you to optimize, you know, uh, various kinds of traffic flows and manufacturing flows, uh, you know, and so on. Um, they're also working on low-power chips that enable 
um, reliable vehicle-to-vehicle uh, -vehicle communication. And what, what can you do with that? If cars can actually talk to each other as they approach each other, it means you can, you can actually now optimize traffic flows. I mean, the people who are really illubian about this will talk about, you know, no, no more need for traffic lights, except they don't talk about the pedestrians, of course, because, <laughs> because cars can actually just pass right through each other because they can slow down and speed up at exactly the right time, right? Uh, I, I think that pussy is a little far off, but conceptually, it, it, it enables that kind of thing. Uh, the, the, the emphasis on reliability, of course, is what you don't need the cars to do is to drop the signal as they're approaching each other. That would be a problem. Um, thirdly, it's, this has been mentioned now several times, uh, we are actually working on autonomous vehicles. So, you know, sometimes you'll see our autonomous vehicles out there on the mezzanine being, being actually tested, and we test them up here, you know, at, at One North. And, and it's, it's an interesting and potentially very effective technology. But we're also working on something else, which, tell, which tells you exactly the value of knowing this information. Uh, there are researchers that have come up with uh, an app which goes on to somebody's smartphone. And of course, they have, to, they have to agree to have it on the smartphone. We don't put it on without them agreeing. But basically, by, it can tell us the modality of transport. Right? We can tell from the app if somebody's walking we can tell if they're on a bus, we can tell if they're in a car, you know, we know when they go down into the MRT, uh, you know, and so on, right? So what's the value of that? We can now, we get a sense of the, tr the movement of people in the city of Singapore. That, that allows one now to start optimizing, again, traffic flows, uh, where you deploy buses, you know, a whole bunch of other things can be done once you have access to that data and you start to mine, you know, uh, patterns from it. So basically, it allows both real, better real-time uh, decision-making, and of course, we, we also use that same data in, in very, some very large-scale simulations we run. So it allows policymakers to ask what-if questions, right? So, so what if, for example, the central business district, there were only autonomous vehicles and buses allowed there? You know, what would the patterns around there look like and what would be the mobility in the central business district? We've actually answered that question. We have an idea of what the answer to that is. So th that's an example of what I mean by it's a combination of, kind of sensors at low cost, the, the data processing, and the ability to use it in simulation and then decision making. Um, let me now turn and talk about something else, which has actually been brought up, which is advanced manufacturing, which I think is also part of Industrial Revolution 4.0. And, and in particular, 3D printing, because I, I am just amazed at this. So you, you, could, you could tell from what I hope Professor Coe said that uh, my, my research area is basically rocket science. So that, that's what I've done you know, for many, many years. I, I did a, quite a bit of work on the shuttle and also on space station. Uh, and you know, one of the things you realize is if you look, if you ever see a picture of a, of a space shuttle main engine, uh, it's a, it, was in, it was an incredibly complicated product. I mean, you see pictures of it, you cannot imagine how many parts are in that thing. And it was, it, it, it was a, an example of, you know, the finest kind of high-tech, high-precision engineering. And, you, you know, the space shuttle main engine was, and actually still is, uh, as an individual engine, the most powerful rocket engine ever built. So, now, uh, but... It was it was enormously expensive to build, and when every time you know uh, something went wrong, they, they had to b replace lots and lots of parts, and that was believe me extremely costly. Now consider this: you know, just just last year from a New Zealand rocket um, lab, they do 3D printing of rocket engines. Actually, there's another company here which makes a rocket engine which only has two parts in it, every, just two, right? Uh, so, but New Zealand Rocket Lab does 3D printing of rocket parts. They, uh, they launch nano satellites into orbit from New Zealand. They operate at costs at least an order of magnitude lower than what the space shuttle could ever do. Uh, the engines are just are 3D printed. You know, and off they go, they launch, and, it, and it, works, it works just fine. I think this is a, a revolution that who's, who's, we just don't know all the implications of, of this yet. 
but the fact that this very complicated engine can be replaced by something, uh, I mean, not quite as powerful, admittedly, but nevertheless, things can be launched into space for an order of magnitude less as an example of the kind of change that actually, you know, comes about from doing that. And, you know, to bring you down closer to Earth, you, you realize now you, there are specific 3D printers for your teeth, you know. My, you know, you, you can go to a dentist, that's which dentist you go to, and they can actually do things that fit exactly to your teeth because they do 3D printing. You can go to certain places in the U.S. and get uh, earphones that fit in your ear. I mean, my, the earphones I get always fall out, but earphones that fit in your ear because they can measure the inside of your ear and then 3D print it, something that fits exactly in your ear. Right? I As I said, the implications of this are, are I think, just quite dramatic. Um, now, I, I actually, coming back to Singapore and the fourth industrial revolution, I, I think Singapore is actually well positioned to seize these opportunities, I think, as you've heard. And why is that? Because it has a well-educated population, has a willingness to invest in skill development, it has a governance structure that's willing to experiment at scale and, and adapt to the learnings, it has significant resources to invest to seize advantage, and it's an attractive business environment. I, I've got to say, if Singapore can't, can't make this thing happen, I, then I, you know, I wonder who can, right? <laughs> because the, all the advantages are here. Right? Um, now, let, let me, for my, my final, I see five minutes, uh, turn and talk about what kind of education should you pursue? Because I am a fundamentally an educator, and uh, I've had to, in my time at MIT, uh, think very long and hard about this. What kind of education should you pursue, right? Uh, for me, it's probably too late, right? <laughs> but for you, what's going to you pursue? Uh, so first of all, as you, as you actually heard, the speed of technology development is increasing, and therefore, therefore, you have to be a lifelong learner. Actually, in my department at MIT years ago, um, back in the, in the early um, 2000s, we, we did a study upon the obsolescence of what we taught uh, seniors. And the answer was everything we taught seniors was obsolete in nine years. Nine years. Everything. So we'd, we'd better teach people uh, things that... We, we can't teach them things that won't become obsolete. We can only teach, um, how, teach them and you how to be lifelong learners because you, you better keep on learning. Uh, otherwise, it feels just going to pass you by. Uh, secondly, I'd say you need to learn how to think analytically and critically because that's a skill that serves you well in many, many, many circumstances. And to do that, you need to learn how to do analysis. You need to learn how to understand inferences from data. I mean, th these are underlying skill sets. And many of these come from, of course, learning the STEM areas in, in some depth. But I think it's also, but critical thinking also comes from a reading of, of history and literature and law and understanding the arguments that people made or where they, where they actually made mistakes. So I'm actually a believer in a balance of balanced education which educates you in these two areas. I mean, these are the two cultures, right? Professor Coe talked about. Thirdly, I would say uh, the skill of communication is essential. And the only way you can learn how to communicate, certainly um, in writing, is by writing. You've got to practice writing and you've got to get feedback on your writing and practice it and practice and get feedback and feedback across a range of audiences until you do better and better and better. And learning how to write and learning how to speak will be very, very important in whatever fields continue to develop. Now, beyond that, I, I don't think I can tell you what are going to be the hot areas 30 years from now. So as, as an example, uh, you know, right now, being an app developer is a hot area. Right? So do you know that that didn't exist before 2007? I mean, to first order. You could actually buy a Palm Pilot, which had primitive apps on them, but nothing like what exists now. So 2007, I mean, that's just over 10 years, you know, right? Um, so cybersecurity is really hot now because people discovered that, you know, with bad people in the world, people will break into, you know, these the systems and therefore... But is that going to be what's going to be hot 10 years from now or 20 years from now? Hopefully, we'll have solved a lot of these cybersecurity problems by then. Something else will be hot. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know what, it's, what it will be uh, other than to say 
that you have to just keep on moving. Now, um, I mean, some things I, I think will play in that realm are the development of AI, understanding how the brain works. I think once we understand more and more of that, it's going to open up whole new areas for people. Uh, the development of the ability to edit DNA which has huge uh, both scientific and ethical implications. The use and analysis of massive amounts of data. The development of new diseases and our response to those diseases. The advent of more personal modalities of transportation and the continuing urbanization and growth of large cities. I think all of these are going to shape the future. What jobs you have to have to be, to be productive members of that society, I, I can't tell you. I can only tell you, you've got to keep, you've got to be prepared for those changes because they will actually happen very rapidly and you're going to have to maneuver in that future. So with that, since I have 35 seconds left, I yield my 35 seconds. <laughs> Uh, we've now come to the question time, and there's microphones on both sides, and I urge you when you go up to ask a question, please identify uh, which college you're at or, or your department if you're not here at the college. And please uh, keep your questions to one question, one question, because we've got a number, a number that uh, want to be asked. I also have been asked by our student group, Polity, to point out that this is such a hot topic that for the first time ever, they will be holding a post-forum forum immediately after this. They'll have to tell you, they're sitting down here in the front, they'll have to tell you where that's occurring if you don't already know, so that we can continue the conversation past even the question time here. Um, so if you don't get a chance to ask a question, save it for the Polity post-forum forum. With that, I'll just hand things back over to Prof. Ko. Thank, thank you, Greg. I, I want to thank uh, Daniel Hastings for a presentation that's full of wisdom, if I may say. Thank you. Um, and now over to you. Welcome questions from you. Please, yeah. All right, thank you. If you could introduce yourself and is just it, ask one question. Is this microphone working? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Thank so, you. Good evening. My name is Samuel. I am a former student at Musa College. I'm an alumni. I am also a first year master student at the, at the at political science department at NUS. Okay, I have a question for Mr. Lim Kok Kiang and Mr. Tan Kok Yang. Did I get your names correctly? Right, thank you. All right, so this question revolves around the topic of global supply chains and the consequences of the fourth industrial revolution on global supply chains. Now, I understand that the... Can, can you speak slower? All right, I'll speak a bit yeah, slower. Speak right. slower. I understand that the current status quo of Singapore manufacturing is such that our manufacturing sector is very dependent on global supply chains. Global supply chains run through our manufacturing se center, uh, manufacturing sector, and that's what drives our manufacturing. Okay, so I also understand from reading about the fourth industrial revolution in general that what the fourth industrial revolution might do to global supply chains is that it might shorten supply, global supply chains. It may lead to more localized supply chains because of the simple possibility that an uh, automated machine, automated factory in, chi in China and US would be rather indistinguishable in terms of cost structures. So my question is with regards to the consequences of fourth industrial revolution on the global supply chain, and what are Singapore's strategies to manage the, cost, the potential consequences of fourth industrial revolution on our supply chains? Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, very good question. Let's take another one, please. Uh, the lady behind you. Um, good evening. My name is Alexis. I'm a year four business student uh, from Tembusu College. So my question is directed to Professor Ho. Um, I believe that large companies such as Amazon and other technology companies are able to harness the positive impacts of data analytics because of the sheer volume and variety of data that they already have. So I would like to ask what's your advice on the approach that startups or small companies can take um, to also reap all these positive effects? Thank you. Thank you. Um, one more question. Hi, I'm Ryan. I'm a year two business and econ student. Uh, my question is directed to the entire panel. Um, I'm just wondering, we've talked about the fourth industrial revolution. Um, how long do you think this revolution will last? Like, 
it's a period of exponential growth. So when do you think it will steady out or like even out? And what do you envisage or hope to see as the end point of this revolution? Okay, <laughs> three, three um, good questions. Um, maybe I start with Daniel and then go, go around. Um, Daniel, you go first. So end end point of this of this revolution. So maybe can we look historically and ask Professor Ko talked about the first three. So for the end point of the, uh, the digital revolution, which started in the in the 60s, I mean there wasn't really an end point, right? It just kind of yeah, it just kind of merged into into where where we are right now, right? And it, it, I, my my guess is if there's going to be uh, something in the future that historians will identify as industrial 5.0, uh, 5 it's probably, it, my own personal guess is probably based around biologics, about things to do with the human body, uh, the dealing with disease or something else like that. that, that that's just my fairly uneducated guess. Right? Uh, Hi. Um, I'll just take the last, last question uh, first. Uh, my own hope is that this uh, this fourth industrial re revolution follows the pattern of you know how railways uh, began. Uh, in the beginning, there were railway tycoons who make tons of money, uh, the equivalent of Bill Gates and people like that. But at some point, the the wealth spreads, and and when when the economy at large makes use of the the, the, the capabilities that railway lines provide uh, to to spur businesses, uh, many other people, many much more wealth is created. And that's, uh, that's distributed across the economy generally. So if you look at today, uh, the, and this goes a little bit to the, to the, the question on, on, on startup. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of, it is easier to be a startup today uh, than say X years ago because you have cloud computing, you don't have to buy your own server, things are scalable, you have uh, all, the, all the libraries, uh, all the AI libraries outside, you can use all those things. And it does mean that you can't compete on some things you probably can't compete on data because if I pull together all the data of Singapore of some form or another, I still cannot fight Google or Facebook for that matter. So it's about being able to make use of those uh, scalable stuff to work at a level that is sort of higher, uh, to, to provide higher level services and, and, and find a niche there. But well, but who am I? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a startup founder, so maybe, you know, <laughs> that's the thing. Hi. So let me talk about the social media data, the small company thing. So, so you guys probably uh, know that if you Google the most popular view uh, video for music is, why is which, which one is this? Anybody? Don't be, don't be shy. You didn't, you didn't do this? It's actually a song that was actually sung by a Spanish singer, a really, very popular. Deposito actually is very, very, five billion views or something. I always wonder how come in the past, if it's 30 years ago, an individual person in a small little village can be so powerful. Can you imagine that? And Gundam Star, you guys should know, right? The Korean. How can a Korean guy who doesn't speak English can be so popular? Because of the internet, right? Come back to the social media one. I actually think that before you start a startup, I'm, I'm a business school professor, I can't help it, right? You could ask yourself, what pain point are you solving for an individual customer? The one that Amazon was solving a pain point that many people have many books they want to read. They don't know which one to read. You're solving a big pain point, right? Once the pain point is decided, then you can get data from social media. I just talked to a company, for example, it's a small company. They want to actually use your social media, internet, Facebook linkages to loan your small loan, instantaneous small loan without looking at your credit ratings. It's social media data. I just look at who you hang out with. You hang out with Tommy. Probably I'll be okay in the credit rating side because he is a respectable individual. I'm probably a respectable individual too, right? So I come back. So, so my, my view on social media is actually, my view is that there are a lot of data out there. Are you able to use those data to create value for an individual? The way I see it, uh, the whole AI is about three Cs. Huh? Capturing data, uh, what uh, da Daniel, uh, da uh, da Daniel was saying is all about low cost sensors and capturing data. But there are a lot of data out there already. The other thing is computation, uh, how you compute and create value. The last thing is the hardest, creating solution for individual customer. 
Many people could do the first two, but not the last one. But last one needs you to have a sense of who, what, do you, what pain point are you solving. That's the first thing. Wh- how long it will last? I actually think that the, this one will last quite a long time, as long as you got uh, maybe up to 30 years. But the next one really is material science, in my view. Uh, same to Daniel, because I'm not exposed to people who are living material in your body. They can repair your bone without the, the repair itself. We already have materials like that. But it's the future. I don't know when it's going to come. I'm hoping that, for example, let's say you have a little scar. You just put something in it that will repair itself and it will be perfect skin again. You know, more, more pimples, all these crazy things. It's possible. Uh, my researchers are working on that. But that combined with AI will be amazing. All right? Then what does it mean to be a machine? One day, should machine be paid a wage for working for us? Because it can repair itself. Machine can repair itself too, right? So no one will ever die. It's kind of a scary thought. But anyway, okay, I'll stop here. Uh, Kyung, could you answer the question yes, about the I global will. supply chain? Yeah, yeah? Sure. So I'll start by maybe adding on to a little bit about, you know, and then I'll answer the question on global supply chain because it's a very good question and we've been thinking about it as well on, on when it starts and when it ends. I mean, honestly, I don't know the answer, but all I can say is this. I think we are really barely scratching the surface of what technology can bring us. If you think about data, there's so much that we don't know and we don't know what we don't know. And when you don't know what, to, what you don't know, how long it lasts and what it can be used for actually depends a lot on all of you out here and how you're going to be able to harness that, right? So that is from a digitalization perspective. And for technology perspective, as Prof Hastings has mentioned, you know, you look at additive manufacturing or 3D printing, we are, again, barely scratching the surface. The technology itself is not new. Huh? From the 1970s, there's rapid prototyping and you're already using um, 3D printing for raisins and to make mock-ups of your... I was just jokingly saying that I don't know how many of you all know Walkmans. Uh, uh, and it's already extinct, right? It's less than 40 years. It's slightly over 40 years old. It's already an extinct product. But again, you know, it was there. But today, it is a lot more. So it's not a new technology. The technology, the, the, the concept of additive manufacturing as opposed to subtractive manufacturing has been there for a long time. But only recently, it has taken off. Only recently, it's been more applicable to metals and rare metals. And that's how, and again, we're barely scratching the surface there as well. So a lot, again, of the applications depends on us as well. So I'll just give an example. Today, when we design a product, we are very much confined by the fact that we think we can manufacture only this and therefore we design it in a certain way. But tomorrow, if we are able to unshackle that and not be bounded by our own mindset of what we, mindset of what we can do, you can, you know, imagine designing something so easy so that all you need to do is then put into a CAD camera and it gets printed out, right? So again, a lot of this is unleashed within us. How much this go, how far this go depends on us. Uh, and that's the thought I would like to push back to you guys. And you guys will dictate how far it goes. Both on a manufacturing technology perspective as well on a digitalization perspective. Now back to the question on supply chain. I think it's a very interesting question. I mean, today, you look at consumer products. Right? We're talking about mass customization. I mean, you look at Adidas, they already got websites where you can actually customize your own shoes and have it delivered to you. But today, it's mainly the sole only. You can almost imagine a time where your consumer products can really be customized all the way to you and it's delivered your doorstep through 3D printing. And that time may not be too far away. We do have companies in Singapore that are looking at the machines that do that. And again, globally, it's been looked at. But that is just but one part of manufacturing. Right? That's a consumer fronting manufacturing where mass customization, meaning lot size one, is a distinct possibility with technology and with digitalization. And so that's one way in which you go where you can imagine manufacturing as being totally decentralized. You go to any place, there's a place there, you print and you deliver. But on the other hand, do not forget that we have industrial products as well. Think your power electronics. Think engines for machines. Think equipment that allows you to make your 3D printing. Now for those, is it really going to be a mass customization or is it really about technology and centralization in order for you to do things better. So I think the verdict is yet out, how supply chains will be dislodged. My personal view is that there's a B2C world, business consumer world, and a B2B world. And the way technology will be adopted will be different. And we can have a role to play. Now, I'll push this back as well in the sense that, look, we have stopped making, we used to make Walkmans, huh, by the way, in Singapore and color TVs as well. We used to stop making all that, and even shoes uh, at some point in time. We stopped making all that now. Now, imagine in mass, mass customization, you can have manufacturing locations all over the world, but who controls it? Who controls manufacturing processes? Who controls supply chain? 
if it's digital, you can be from one location where you control the whole Asia Pacific in terms of manufacturing. Now, can Singapore play that role? In the industry whereby we are already not competing in because we have lost out in terms of cost competitiveness from a labor cost perspective. It is a distinct possibility. So I think we are very optimistic that actually technology adoption will work for us as much as against us. It's all up to us as well from that perspective. Sorry. On to the second question. I, I want to frame it a little differently. The way I frame it is going to be, is the consumers and producers have to be in the same place. Your point is quite well taken that in, it currently, you find places that you can produce cheaply and you ship it to a place that might be consumed at a different place. That's your question, I think, right? And I agree, in the future of AI and digital technology is very advanced. Consumption and production location can be the same place that a factory just outside your, your home will ship it to you whenever you need it, that's it. And in that world, if it ever happened, Singapore would compete on a different basis. We would be the person who figure out what's the latest technology for the machine and whatever creative design that you might have, we can't compete on cost really because cost is no longer a differentiator for whoever wants to compete. You have to be the brain or the knowledge behind the technology and so on. Um, Daniel, may I ask you a question? Um, recently, Bill Gates made a statement that shocked everybody. He said to level the playing field between man and machine, we may have to consider taxing robots. What, what's your reaction to that? Yeah, I actually, I do remember him saying that. Uh, well, I, I, I suppose the logic is, you know, if, if you, you can't tax people if people aren't working, uh, and if they're replaced by a lot of robots, then you, you tax the robots, and that's how you get money, right? Now, my own personal feeling is, Maybe in this case, I'm a technological optimist. I, I thought it was crazy, actually. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think it's crazy, yeah, right, right. Um, because I, I certainly the historical evidence suggests, at least up to now, every time there's been these kind of technological revolutions, new kinds of jobs have emerged, right? So I, I guess I don't see a need to tax robots because I think for people, jobs will emerge, right? have a slightly different view. Uh, the view is this. Think of horses and car, right? When we have car, do we tax the car? We do because it creates a negative externality on the environment. So my question really, should you tax a robot is a function of whether they impose negative externality on the environment itself. If it does, then you have to tax them. But, but your point is well taken that think of horses and car is really like computer replacing a human, right? So this, I might have to put horses like human, but like horses, and it happens. We tax the car because car has created pollution yeah. for us. Right? So I actually can't think of a world where you be logical and, and kind of rational to tax a robot unless you create something that imposes a cost on a human being in our daily livings and so on. Um, let's take another round of questions from the students. Anyone? Let's Hello. take three questions at a time. Yeah. All right, uh, good evening, panel. Um, this question is directed to uh, Professor Ho and Mr. Lim. Um, on the topic of new businesses uh, surrounding, oh, sorry, I'm an engineering science student, year two from Temple School College. On the topic of uh, new businesses surrounding data and existing technologies, well, I'd agree with what uh, Mr. Tan has mentioned just now about how much easier it is to have uh, to start up a business, a business right now. They mostly boil down to well, innovation, execution, and sometimes timing. However, same, some problems require new technologies and or new dis scientific discoveries to solve. So my question is, should we encourage uh, young talents to pursue further, further education, i.e. Uh, masters or PhD, with starting up as a motivation, using new uh, cutting-edge technology to put Singapore in the forefront of this fourth uh, industrial revolution, as opposed to the more conventional motivation like academia or research? Thank you. Um, thank you. I think we can... Extend that to all the panel, to all the members of the panel. Okay, let's take two more questions. Yes. Uh, hi, my name is Isaac. I'm a year three political science major. Uh, my question is for the whole panel. So, um, with the fourth industrial revolution, I think a few of the speakers have mentioned that a lot of jobs will be displaced. And you also mentioned that the total economic pie may grow bigger. People may gain more wealth. Total wealth increases. 
Um, but this wealth, although people do gain more wealth, this wealth is not redistributed equally. The economic elites, so those who own the tech giants, manufacturing industries, they gain wealth at a higher rate than the poor. And this exacerbates inequality. So my question is, do you think the fourth industrial revolution will be politically and economically sustainable? And what will be the changes to our current political and economic system? Thank you. Thank you. Very good question. Um, one more, please. Um, very good evening, everyone. My name is Yash. I'm a year one Paul Science student. My question is uh, quite a general question, but it's um, related to artificial intelligence per se. It's for the entire panel. Um, when artificial intelligence eventually integrates into our workforce, will they be given rights akin in a general sense to workers in a company, for example, um, seeing that they are not only just the means of production, but they are also becoming the operators of the means of production as well? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, three, three, three good questions. Maybe we begin from, from this end. Uh, okay, I'm um, not sure whether I... I, I will, you know, start and then we can all add on. Uh, on the issue of startups, I think um, there, are mul there are different ways in which I, at least from what I've heard, you know, um, talking to some venture capitalists and, and so on, I think there are, there are multiple pathways to take. And uh, some believe that, you know, working and working in industry, gaining some knowledge and networks actually helps you better. Others believe in going out there from day one and learn from your own mistakes and therefore from there move on to try again because basically you have to fail and fail again, right? So I think there's, the, there's no rocket science in this. I think it depends on what each one of you uh, has the passion for and your capacity to, you know, want to keep trying. So I, again, I think there's really no right formula. If there is, I think I wouldn't be here already, right? So um, I think it's, it's, there are multiple ways. But I suppose the... the the point I want to make also is that actually technology is going to play a big role in how some of these startups uh, will evolve on top of business model. So again, something to bear in mind. Um, I think um, on the job dislocation and therefore wealth distribution portion, I think it's really a good uh, um, question. And I think the verdict is actually yet out also how much jobs will be disrupted and replaced versus, you know, Jobs having, I mentioned that earlier, transform a little bit, 60% the same, 40% different, and how do we cope with it? I think that is a change that we have to embrace, and this whole concept of lifelong learning, therefore, uh, is an important one. Uh, even today, as we speak, there is you know, wealth distribution. I think that's something that we have to put a lot of um, uh, uh, emphasis on in terms of trying to address this. But I think what's equally important is really to be able to equip each one of us to be able to do well and excel uh, in the world of tomorrow. And again, that requires, I think, in my opinion, three parties to work together. I mean, there is the government, but there is also the companies and enterprise that you work for. And there's also you yourself. And I can't stress that uh, enough. I think it's really the three parties working together to ensure that uh, we pick the right skills, we have lifelong learning opportunities, learn, relearn, unlearn, learn, unlearn, relearn, whatever we call it. And then that allows us to be in a better position to create wealth for ourselves and for the enterprises or the government that we work for. Because um, ultimately, I do agree with Professor Hastings as well. I mean, there is, I, I don't think um, robots will take over human beings and then you just have one, per, one winner and the rest of us losers plus the robots, right? I mean, one example that's often cited and I'll cite it here as well, uh, that happened in the past was ATM machines. I think if you remember, Okay, all of you don't remember. Okay. <laughs> when ATM machines first came out, you know ATM machines had drawn money out, right? There was a huge concern in the finance industry because up until then, your teller, your people sitting beside the, you know, when you give them a passbook, they chop, they give you money. This was the predominant, it, it is a big job creation and a lot of people doing that. So when the ATM machines first came out, people were very worried that with that, oh no, no more banks, no more jobs. But if you look at how the finance industry has reinvented itself despite and in spite of technology, in fact, working with technology and, what, and the banking that you know today, I think it is one point to show that it may not be exactly the same example, but it's one point to show that there'll be new jobs created, new needs to be met, and therefore creating value for your customer and therefore creating value for the people that work there. And so 
you know, yes, it is a challenge, but I think let's also think about it from that perspective. There are cases in the past that shows that it actually, you know, can be done. Um, just to follow up, huh? yeah. the financial industry is now faced another, with a, another challenge, yes. financial technology, you know. You know, so this is very going to be very disruptive. Yes. Yeah, and some banks like DBS are trying to reinvent themselves yes. as both, uh, a, you know, brick and mortar bank, a virtual bank. You know? yes. Is, yes. Is that the future? No, I think it's really about embracing technology and therefore answering depending on what customer needs are and able to provide the 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 the, the necessary solutions for it. So I do feel that we are again just scraping the surface there, and again even with the digital bank. What are the other customer needs that are met today that the banks can perhaps provide? What about micro payments? What about some of these things, you know, where banks today typically may not be so well accustomed to serve? And that's where your Alibaba and your Tencent comes in, right? But if you look at finance, there's a lot more opportunities going forward that technology can enable as well, as much as it disrupts. So I think that is a constant process. And I think, you know, being human beings, I'm trust that we're smart enough to continue to reinvent ourselves to meet the needs and therefore create value in the process. Thank you. Uh, take so on. Actually, I, I have to say I thank the first speaker asking that question about academic research. And I, I, I'm a professor. I, as a kid, I, when I'm 13 years old, so I wanted to be a professor already. It was a dream come true for me. And I always tell people, if you want to do PhD, I will give you three things why you should do PhD. First, as a professor, you choose who to work with, you choose what to work on, you choose when to work hard. There's no other job in the world that you have these three freedoms. I, I meant it seriously. You choose what to work on, who to work with, and when to work hard. There are days I work day and night, there are weeks so I'll just goof off for a week, I'm okay. So, but come back to this a little bit, the data doesn't, sh I mean, doesn't come, come out to be that way because of the thousand PhD we produce every year, around 800 to 1,000, 80% go to industry, 20% go to academia, right? So I would love to have a group of students start company instead of go to industry. In fact, I'm going to launch a scheme. Uh, okay, I'm not going to put on this. So we're going to launch a scheme to encourage our PhD students to start company. We're going to give out 50 startup seed funding next year, starting next year. So I would love you guys to be involved in that because I think that's the future. And we really want to be kind of behind you, kind of cheering you on, making sure you're successful so that you kind of bring glory back to NUS. That's the first thing. Secondly, about this inclusive growth question, which is a very good question. And in some way, actually, I want to push back to you guys. You with the elites, and you should be socially responsible to bring the rest of the people along. In some way, I expect you to give back to society and try to help those people who are in need. And I can help you to be successful, but you have to help the rest of people to be successful. And we plan to have that. Uh, one of my priorities as a provost, I'm obsessed with getting all our students to really make an impact. Not just make a lot of money, but make an impact that will affect the rest of society. You are actually, by definition, in the minority because less than 50% of people get into NUS. You will always be in the minority. You are very fortunate, privileged. I'm hoping that you guys, after this, uh, you will start doing something for the rest of the uh, the people and make a difference and, and, and promote inclusive growth, right? The last question was a very good one. I always I like to use example like Iron Man has a AI butler called Jarvis, right? Do you think Jarvis was being respected by Iron Man? They're kind of friends, right? So in a way, if the AI person is actually helping you and improve your life, you might be treating like a like dog and cat, a pet. So so this person is helping you and. And I think Iron Man does respect uh, Jarvis. Uh, you guys agree? Agree, yeah? I, I watch Iron Man a lot, so I know. So, so I can see the world that is between the man, human, mankind, and the robots, how you want to treat the robots. And to the extent they are productive and helping to make your life easier, you might give them a lot of respect. There's nothing wrong about that. Should we encourage young talents with masters and PhDs to pursue startups? Well, I think the answer is uh, absolutely, right? Uh, one, this is one way, apart from uh, working for industry, uh, this is one way where the, the intellectual property, the knowledge that is created in research labs get translated out, uh, where the talent flows out. And I think in the startup space, we, we do need a little bit more of the startups that are based on tech 
uh, what we call the deep tech startups. And I think this is a this is an opportunity, and I think it's, and so. The answer is absolutely. Oh, do do but do we need uh, startup founders to have PhDs? I think maybe not all are. So so it, it depending on how you flip the question, right? So the second question I think was Isaac who asked about jobs. I think uh, first of all for Singapore's uh, uh, situation at a macro level, we have more jobs than people, and we are going to have more and more jobs compared to people. So in terms of automation, using AI and so on, at a macro level, we absolutely need this to give us that runway for economic growth, economic value creation. Um, <clears throat> what kind of but jobs will change? And I think that the, the three types of jobs that will stay uh, with humans, at least for the, for, the, for the foreseeable future, are jobs that are high tech, for obvious reasons, are jobs that are high trust, you need someone to sign off of some, on some high trust. So a judge, for example, a subordinate court judge, for example, I will see a very long time before uh, we can ever entrust a, 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 a machine to do that. So high trust jobs. And the final one, which may be surprising, are jobs that are high touch. Um, one of the most difficult things to automate um, uh, today is are simple things like feeding an elderly person, you know, or changing his 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 diaper, uh, things like that. Uh, how about um, preschool teacher, uh, things like that, where you need the human because it is it is a high touch job, and we are also a long way from being able to automate uh, those uh, those jobs. Now, high tech and high trust jobs will get their due share of um, of salary. Uh, today, I think globally uh, and in Singapore as well, the adjustment that we have not made in the wage market is to pay high touch jobs a, a more because they are not particularly replaceable. Your, your nurse uh, who looks after the elderly, your preschool teacher and so on. So I think that will be an interesting uh, social uh, uh, movement, uh, 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 social economic movement going forward. Uh, should AI have rights? I think we are at a point where <coughs> we are talking about regulating uh, for uh, artificial, what they call artificial narrow uh, intelligence. Uh, we are more concerned with uh, uh, the autonomous vehicle not behaving as it should uh, and setting the rules around that <coughs> than the other way around, which is you know, the autonomous vehicle deciding to you know, um, take a trip uh, off the causeway uh, to Malaysia and do its own thing and all that. So we are quite far from the, 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 the AGI point and I think we are quite far from the point where we talk about rights uh, to protect the, the, the AI. I know there have been, there have been <coughs> questions like, you know, if the AI painted a picture, who should the picture belong to and things like that. But I think we are, we are really quite far from the point where we need to have rights to protect the, the, the algorithm. Daniel? Yeah, so the first question about should masters of PhDs have that kind of a startup focus. So, so this, this is one of the areas, just one of my hot button topics, which is I, I personally think most, certainly PhDs are way too narrowly focused on you know, some esoteric era of research, you know, that to, which delights some professor, but in the long term, you know, the, its value may be questionable. So I actually put, believe that PhDs, certainly PhDs should get a, br a broader range of skills and commuting, including the skill to communicate, you know, effectively to a broad range of audience. I mean, for example, that I think would help a lot with just science communication in, in the public. So, so in that sense, certainly I, I, I believe that teaching about startups is something that for some subset of PhDs would be very valuable. So one of the things we're actually doing in the center, which I run, we, we only have a few PhD students, but we have a lot of postdocs. So every postdoc who comes in now is offered a, a set of courses, which which teaches them about you know the markets, products, product market fits, about finance. What does finance mean? I mean, how do you think about all of those things? Because the reality is, in the current education system, wherever they come from in the world, they don't have it. They just don't have this knowledge base. So, so I actually think that's actually very important to do. And as Professor Ho said, some large fraction of these people are not going to end up in academia. They're going to end up somewhere else, right? But you don't, you don't have to do a PhD to start a successful enterprise, right? No, you don't. I mean, two of the people most admired in the world, Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg, right. both dropped out of Harvard College. They did. You know? 
Maybe but but I can you can you tell the student don't don't emulate them and drop out anyway. Well, but the, the, so but this is this is by the way where you need to have some understanding. Of, I'm sure you do of, of statistics, right? <laughs> Which is those those are singular individuals. If you certainly if you look over a broad population and ask for the people who drop out of college, do they end up being billionaires? What's the probability of that? It's so vanishingly small that it's not worth calculating. For most people, it makes sense to finish college and then use the education they get, you know, to further further their career, right? So uh, are highly passionate about what they want to do. So yeah. So if you are super high passionate about what you want to do, I forgive you. You want to drop out, I, I forgive you. But don't do that unless you have super high passion. Like, like Bill Gates will be working day and night on the little kind of programming that he's doing. And how many of you guys are prepared to do it without sleeping for many, many nights? So, so I actually, the, the, uh, the kind of startup fund that we are trying to set up can be given to uh, undergraduates too if you are prepared to kind of work really hard on some high-tech project, we are prepared to open up to people in engineering, whatever major you're in, doesn't matter. Okay. Um, Daniel, could you answer th the very good question about inequality? Yeah. yeah it's so the fourth industrial revolution right. going to make worse this global trend of inequality. Well, we, we, we already see in some countries the inequality increasing. You know, now, part of the thrust of the question was, will that be politically or economically s sustainable? There have been, there've been lots of societies, human societies, which have had very large levels of inequality that have not ended up collapsing in revolution. I mean, some have, but lots have not, right? So I, I don't take it as a given that will happen, but, that, but now you have to ask the question, you know, what's the fair and right and just thing to do? W whether or not it ends up c c collapsing in society, which co forces the issue, of course. I, I actually completely agree with what uh, uh, Prof. Ho said, you know, it, it's incumbent upon, I mean, the people like you who are in, th in that lingo, the, the cognitive knowledge workers of society, to not only further your own interests, but also to spend time helping everybody so that society is a better society as a result, right? So it's about giving to the whole society, right? Could, could you explain um, how a man who started an online company to sell books, Jeff Bezos, to become one of the richest men in the world. Yeah. Jeff Bezos of yeah, Amazon, yeah. no? Could you explain that? I don't understand it, you know? What's... <laughs> <laughs> Do you understand? No, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I have a complete understanding of it either. Obvi obviously, he, he's obviously a man with passion, as, as you said, okay. because if you look at what he's doing, he's not just doing you know that. I mean, he's got he's got a rocket company, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, you know, Blue Origin, which yeah. is also building rockets, just like Elon Musk. So he's obviously a man driven by passion, and he accumulated enough money to make it actually happen. And he took a bet on Amazon. You know, I mean, today we see Amazon as successful, right? I mean, when it started, was it perceived to be successful? It was losing money. So an interesting thing about Google, I mean, we see Google is successful now, but if you went back to uh, the mid-90s, most people thought Yahoo would beat yeah. Google. Yeah. Yeah. Yahoo, I mean, what's ever happened to Yahoo? It's gone, right? So <laughs> just eaten up. Right. So can I predict <laughs> those? <laughs> Boy, if I could predict those things, I'd be a rich person. <laughs> I can tell you. So, yeah, please take one. Oh, thing on Amazon, I actually analyze the company quite. I teach a class in uh, pricing and so on. So Amazon started as a vir virtual shopping mall. If the way you think about it, there are many, many shops. They are basically a virtual shopping mall. The nice thing about that shopping mall is, unlike a regular shopping mall, space is free. In the actual physical shopping mall, space is precious and expensive. So it started with this basic idea of virtual shopping mall. Now it's actually very compelling because everything they do, it's just add on and there's People like to sh uh, one-stop shopping, just go to the same place and buy the same thing. With the Amazon Prime, they were launched a couple of years back. Your shipping is free once you pay a fixed fee. Now, there's no reason to go to other place to buy because other places where you pay the shipping charges. Indirect, they, they kill out the rest of the businesses, right? So come back to this a little bit. This is the guy who actually has sustained the business or believed in the business for many, many years without making a single cent. I remember Alibaba, when it went IPO, make fun of uh, Amazon, well, this company is still losing money. We're making money at the first quarter, right? But now they are very successful. And I predict that 
many of the small businesses will go away because this company is going to deliver drone deliver to your home. Uh, we actually try to help them to solve their logistic problem. They have six distribution centers in the U.S. They've now become multiple because they can ship to you very fast. And Google is doing into that business of doing the same thing, deliver grocery because, because they want to beat Amazon owning the mind share of the customers. Okay, I'll stop here. Um, it, it's almost 9 o'clock. So I'm going to ask the final question of the four panelists. What else must Singapore do in order to maximize the chances that we will produce um, our, our own Google, our own uh, um, Amazon, our own Facebook? Or, or is it not a, an impossible dream because we don't have scale? You know? right. Right. So start with you. Then. I'll start with the easy one and you guys can finish. <laughs> so, so I actually believe in this. Huh? Internet companies are born global because you can use the website to serve everybody in the world. right? So. The fact that you are an internet company, you will be not constrained by the market size that you have, first thing. Second thing is this, that I think the future is you guys. I really believe that because you have things, you have gone through and experiences that I have not gone through. You do things that I don't understand. Like my son is doing things, I never understand what he's doing. My, my daughter too, right? He will sleep at uh, 3 a.m., wake up at noon, and without having breakfast, he's okay with I'm not okay with it, so obviously. So come back to this. So... I think the limit is our Singaporean creativity. There are many possibilities. You may be able to see that I can't see it. I'm hoping that some of you guys will really see some spark there that, that you can really create a dream for Singapore to have a kind of unicorn, the Google of Singapore, right? I think it all relies on you guys. I hate to be you, hold you accountable if when I'm 80 years old, there's no Google of Singapore, I'm going to blame it on you guys in this audience because I challenge you to do that from today. So I, I actually agree with what Prof Ho said. I think creativity is the key, but what Singapore must do is work hard to establish a culture that rewards creativity, both its success and, and when things fail, and when things fail. Right? I mean, if, if, if there's something that characterizes around where MIT is and around Silicon Valley, it's, a, it's just a culture that makes it easy. You know, People try things, they fail, it's okay, you fail. We'll try again, you know. I mean, I know faculty who started five or six companies, and some of them have failed. Yeah, there is no culture of that here, right? I think uh, two things. Uh, the first is uh, ambition. I, th I think that's that's important. Ambition at national level, ambition at an individual level. Um, the the examples, for example, I shared today, uh, you can think of them as very very little instances that scratch the surface. I mean, uh, something to find where fires occur. Uh, little things to improve services, but it just shows what is possible. It just scratches the surface. Uh, how do I then use digital technology to just extend an elderly lady's uh, independent life by five more years? Uh, that, that surely is, 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 a, is a degree of improvement to human life that is not measurable by, 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 by anything. How do I use um, a combination of uh, smart public transportation, autonomous vehicles and so on to claim back some of our land space? We have 12% of our land space as roads. So how do I claim back some of that, whether you use that for parks, for playgrounds, what have you, and so on. That is a tremendous improvement to our quality of life. And th this, is, this is the ambition that we want to, want to achieve. That, that's the first point. And the second point, I think, as a nation, we have to find that special spot where we are, we are special but not unique. We, we cannot be too unique because if we are too unique, then you can only sell in Singapore because other, other places, it's, 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 not, it's not relevant. Um, but you want, to be, you want to be special. You want to be the first uh, to do this, to prove that the technology is possible, to deploy it at scale, to have the rules and regulations to make it work. And then you can export it to other cities, to other countries with similar uh, problems in similar uh, uh, situations. So that's, 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 the, that's the trick to find that sweet spot where we are not too unique and, and but we're special enough to be the first to do it. And then we can, uh, we can deploy it, we can export it outside. And that's, that's how I think we can get, uh, with ambition and with that regional global view, we can get to a, to a Google and Amazon from one of you guys, which uh, I will not be surprised if there is. Thank you. Okay, Kaolang, you have the last yeah. word. Um, okay, so I agree with all of the above. 
Um, I think it is something you, need, you guys need to focus on, but yet it's also uh, overcoming a shortcoming. That means basically you have to think global first. You have to think global, think global, think global. Because at the end of the day, we don't have a market. And if you look at a lot of companies and technology companies, they start with a huge base and then they scale from there on a global basis. Whether you like it or not, we don't have the luxury. So from the word go, it has to be global. You have to think global before you can make it. Right? So it, you see it as a disadvantage or you can see it as a stretch that allows you to do and go places that other people wouldn't be able to go to right from day one. So I think that is uh, the additional point I would to add on. And I think just as a side point again, to enable that, I think all of you will need to travel the world and be out there and not just stay in Singapore. Sometimes you know, we hear saying about how all of us are very comfortable, not prepared to go out there into emerging markets to try our luck or to take up you know, work. But you need to be out there. Be out there so that you can learn, you can experience, so that you can think global. So that's how I would put it. I think, Greg, you agree that this has been a very good forum. So will you join me in thanking the four panellists? Thank you, Prof. Ko. And uh, with that, we call the forum to a close. But I want to remind you that our student group polity is uh, going to have a post-forum forum. In the, is it the first floor of the, um, the student lounge? Student lounge is the first floor of the tower if you'd like to continue the conversation. Thank you all. Good night.